Welcome to Markham Baptist Church. We're glad that you're watching us today. We're missing seeing you in person and having an opportunity to meet you one-on-one. -on -one. We've been doing these online services now for almost four months, and we're looking forward to the opportunity of sharing in ministry together face-to-face -face in the future. If you're having a challenge of one kind or another, or would like our prayers for you and your life, uh, please check out our website, markhambaptist.org. And on that website, there is a list of ways that you can contact us. We hope you'll reach out either through email or telephone and let us know of your needs so that we can be a supportive presence and the extension of God's love for you. Here's our call to worship this morning. Come, all thirsting for the living God. Come, you who are acquainted with grief or oppression or opposition. Come you who are in need of hearing a good word from God today. Come and find hope for your life and strength through the promises of God. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. We gather together in your presence, O oh God, with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you and eager to hear your word. Holy God, be to us the guiding pillar of truth that we might follow. For those who seek knowledge or understanding, bring persons to them of wisdom and integrity that they might grow up in all things good. Redeeming God, be to us the flowing waters of life itself for all who thirst after righteousness and bring to those yet without the basic necessities of clean drinking water, new resources that provide health that they might flourish Spirit of God, be the ever-blowing wind of refreshment upon all who are feeling exhausted by the weight of life's care and provide help for those overwhelmed by the heat of this day. We gather in Jesus' name, trusting your truth, drinking at the gentle streams of your word and seeking the inspiration of your spirit even now. And so we gather and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading comes from Psalm 65, verses 1 to 4 and 9 to 13 of the New Revised Standard Version. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills give themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This morning I'm going to be talking about God keeping his promises. So I'm going to be looking at the story of Noah and the ark um, that comes to us from Genesis chapter 8 and 9. So a simple rundown of the story is God goes to Noah and asks him to build a boat, a large boat. And he tells Noah to bring two of every animal and his family and friends onto the boat because God is going to be sending a flood. God was angry at the world, so he flooded the earth. God made two promises to Noah when he asked him to build this boat. He promised one, that he would dry up the earth. And two, his second promise was that he would never flood the earth again. God sent two signs to Noah to make sure that Noah understood that God fulfilled his promise. The first was sending the dove with an olive branch in his mouth to indicate that there was dry land. 
So when Noah and his family left the ark, they saw that the surface of the earth was dry. The second promise um, that God kept was that he would never flood the earth again. And he used the symbol of the rainbow when Noah and his family and the animals left the ark. They saw that God had kept his promise and that he was promising down the road that he would not flood the earth again. We hear all the time that God keeps his promises. In Psalm 145, 13, the Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all that he does. Now, in fact, in the Bible, God has made 140 promises that he has kept each and every one. God makes sure that when he makes his promises, that he keeps them. God made the promise that he would send his son to earth to die for us on a cross so that we could spend everlasting life with him. And he kept that promise. God keeps his promises. God promised Noah that he would protect Noah and his family. He did. God keeps his promises. We can follow examples of keeping our promises too. It's a good idea to be careful of what kind of promises we make because there are some things that we cannot do and there are some things that will get us into trouble. Now, in the Bible, sometimes we see the word covenant replaced with a word promise or vice versa. A covenant is like a legal contract uh, between two parties. So a covenant that God has made with us is a legal contract that God promises to fulfill between us and him. It's important for us to keep our promises, that when we say we will do something, that we follow through. So making promises is just as important as following through with them because we need to make sure it's a promise that we can keep. Thus, why God never told us that life would be easy. It would be impossible for him to keep that promise. But the fact that he says he will never leave us through any hard time in our life, that is something he can fulfill. So next time after a rainy day, you look out on the, out the sky and you see a beautiful rainbow, remember that that is a symbol of God's love, peace, and grace with his personal creation. It is his promise to us that he loves us and will always take care of us. Please bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for keeping your so many promises. Lord, we are so grateful that you are beside us each and every day. Lord, we're also so thankful for the signs that you send to us of the reminders of your promises you have made to us. So that when we look into the sky and see a rainbow, may we remember what you have told us through the Bible that you will always keep your promise. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning, and may we go out into the world showing your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and everlasting joy that you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
reading from Matthew 13, 1 to 9, 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such person has no root, but only endures for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But, at, but as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruits and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every springtime, I head to Home Hardware and I buy a, a bag of grass seed to make sure that I can thicken up the yard and uh, the grass that has been killed over the winter. A lot of my grass today in the heat of summer, however, looks more like uh, brown bristles than it does green blades of grass. Come July in the heat of the summer, I have to take some of my flowering plants off the fence and uh, bring them closer into the porch to, to hide them from the scorching sun and to give them a rest in the shade because otherwise they'd just be burnt off. Jesus tells a story about a sower who goes out and sows some seeds. We don't know what they are. It could have been wheat or corn or something else. But one thing is made clear. The seed is good. The seed is good. Each seed has within it the capacity to grow and do what it is supposed to do. It, it is to grow something and because it is that kind of seed, it gives the result. The challenge happens because of the soil it falls upon. In his parable, Matthew says some of the seed falls on um, hardened soil, soil that is part of a path that is beaten down and uh, there's no space for the roots to go in and so a lot of the seed gets snatched up by birds who have a, a lovely meal because of it. Some of the seed falls on rocks and it's, it's just right there in the scorching sun. It doesn't have a chance either. It withers in the heat of the day. And then other seed falls among mature thorn bushes and those thorn bushes end up choking the young seedlings for, for the nourishment that both are fighting for. God knows the truth 
about hard soil, and so do we. So do parents who have tried to offer a word of encouragement or kindness uh, to a son or daughter and feel like those words are falling on deaf ears. We know what hard soil is all about. We also know what thorns are like, and so do business people and entrepreneurs who put everything into a, a, a business startup, hoping that they can attract new customers, only to find those prospective customers crossing the street to another place and they lose the business. The thistles and the thorns that we, we have to put up with. We also know paths that have been taken at first with great enthusiasm, only to be abandoned at the first sight of an approaching storm or, or difficulty, challenge, or temptation. And so do teachers and instructors and counselors. And yet they pour into those people the same care and value that they do to, to anyone, no matter how that person has been treated in the past or what people might say of them. Matthew tells us that one out of four of the seeds that are, are sown fall on what is called good soil. Only one in four. And of that 25%, though, it falls on good soil, and some producing up to a hundred times what was originally sown. Those are impressive results. Given the choice, we would know what kind of soil we want to be. We want to be the good soil, of course. We want to produce something, whatever that something is, with our lives. And once we make that decision, perhaps you and I can just sit back and, and read or hear this story with, um, with a sense of being unaffected bystanders. We can be unfazed by the outcome for the other three quarters of those listening to this story. It's easy to self-identify with the good soil, but surely every one of us has within us portions of each of those other three soils. Barbara Brown Taylor in one of her sermons says this, I started worrying about what kind of ground I was on with God. How many birds were in my field? How many rocks? How many thorns? And I started worrying how I could clean them all up. How I could turn myself into a, a well-tilled, well-seeded, well-fertilized field for the sowing of God's Word. And I started worrying about how the odds were three and one against me. She was wondering how she could beat those odds by, by cleaning up her act. I've read it that way too, perhaps you have, kind of as a, a challenge to us to improve our lives. In other words, if this was a story about you or me, we would make sure that if it was describing our lives, it would have a great ending. Every seed would fall on good soil, well-tilled, well-watered, well-fertilized soil. And uh, I can work on that. I can, I can do that, or at least so I tell myself. The Protestant work ethic has uh, laden many people with so much guilt they have enough to live a lifetime with. They can't shake the feeling of just not being good enough for, for someone, whether it's a teacher or whether it's for a spouse or a parent or someone else. Not being good enough or uh, not having enough or not, uh, not making enough money, having enough success. They're caught in a cycle of always striving to be better, perhaps even striving to be the best in their, their peer group. But what if this parable is not at all about us? What if it's about something else entirely? That it's, it's not about our successes and failures. It may not even be about our walk with God in itself. The challenges the sower faces are challenges that faced Jesus and his followers in their ministry. The seed of Jesus' teachings had often fallen on rocks and thorns. Early in Matthew, we're told that the, the disciples lost faith when a storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew tells us that the Pharisees were forever after Jesus, working to choke out his message to the people that would gather around him to listen and to learn. 
and surely he encountered some of the hardest soil of his teaching and in his life when he entered his hometown of Nazareth. They rejected him before he had a chance to speak a word about the kingdom of God and, and for them to really get to know his example and his life. One commentator suggests that, that Jesus did not just tell this story, he lived it. He lived it. And so the community for whom Matthew writes this story also, first century Palestine was not an easy place or time to be a disciple of this new rabbi, Jesus. Jesus reminds his followers that rejection, rejection of his message, doesn't mean that the message itself is wrong or inadequate or that their efforts are wrong or faulty in any way. He simply says rejection is a fact of life for the follower of Jesus. Even among those who open their hearts and lives to God's good news can find that trouble will outweigh their enthusiasm. And belief can also be compromised by the piling on of the cares of life and the seductions that come to us from any and every direction. Following Jesus has never been easy. It's not meant to be. Being a disciple is disciplined, hard work where we are meant to follow the rabbi and his teachings and to discipline our lives to do so means that we will encounter struggles and challenges, resistance, rejection. On our own, we might feel inadequate because we are. Romans 3.23 puts it this way, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's why if we look at this from a merely pragmatic point of view, it can be rather depressing. The odds are not at all good. One in four make it. One in four, good soil. That's what Matthew 13 says, or what Jesus says in Matthew 13. In the way Romans puts it, all have sinned. The odds makers are looking at us saying, it's not looking good for you. And yet, if you take another perspective, if we look at it not from the perspective of um, pragmatism, but rather promise, then we discover the gospel. We hear this story as it was meant to be read and listened to. Because it's not about whether or not our efforts are good enough. It's about the sower and the seed. It's about what God promises. For everyone has sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. We know that. There's our sense of inadequacy, our striving to be better or best. But then hear this in verse 24. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. Forget your worries. Forget about how good or bad the soil of your life is today or has been in the past. The seed is good. Every seed. This is a story about the extravagance of God. A God who gives himself with abandon to the world. God is not stingy. And even in this story, he's, he's not very practical either. He seeds the world over with joy. He seeds it over not with just the written word, but with his living word. By sending Jesus Christ himself, by giving him with abandon in the dry places, in the rocky places, in the weed infested places of the world and of our lives, just as much as it is sown in those good places. We have a relentless God we have a God who is indiscriminate with his love for us. So forget all the odds makers and forget what others are saying about the chances of the seed of faith being able to take root over here but not over there, or the seeds of faith taking root in your life or not in someone else's. Forget about all of that. The sower throws his seed anywhere in order to suggest that in the final analysis, Anywhere 
is the, the arena of God's care and God's remarkable redemptive activity. It's not limited to the places and people that you and I might judge worthy. God treats every life with equal value and worthy of his overflowing compassion. This story does not end with the inhospitable soils. It doesn't even end with a, a good harvest because of good seed. It ends with a miracle, a hundredfold harvest, 100 fold. Who would have seen that coming? But this is not a story that relates to our practicality or pragmatism. It's a story of promise, a promise that is given to us by God that, that no matter what our lives are like, rocky or hard or thorn infested, challenged or difficult or upset, we have a God that continues to sow the seed of good news for us to receive and to hear and to apply in our own lives to welcome. This is not a story about just keeping on, keeping on in the hardships of life and opposition or rejection. It invites us to believe in a God of abundance, a God of abundance. In the very seasons where we find the most challenge and difficulty, in those seasons where we, we feel the odds are stacked against us. Scripture says this, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Yes. Yes, he will. Thanks be to God. of man there seems so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves but we know that your God Yours is the victory. We know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we'll step into the valley unafraid. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. A part of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love. Rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons. And by your spirit, breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save. You alone can save. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive. Come alive, a part of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. So breathe the breath of God, now breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God, now breathe. So breathe. The breath of God now breathe the breath of God breathe the breath of God now breathe we call out to dry bones come alive come alive we call out to
to dead hearts come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. Would you pray with me? Oh God, whatever we say today, whatever we do today, before a word is on our tongue or an action is offered, your word has already spoken life into us. Your act of redemption and deeds of love have already brought salvation and hope within reach of everyone who seeks you. All that is left for us is to respond to respond to what you have already done and given. And so today we want to thank you for your promises throughout Scripture and time. All good things come from you, O oh God, especially in the face of every fear and temptation, any pain or frustration, and in whatever wearying concern we might carry or dislocation we encounter. Lord, you are there before we even find the breath to summons you. You're acting with power to rescue us before we find the words to seek your help. You are there with judgment to allow our repentance before we ever realize our sin. And you are there with love to redeem us before we have turned around to discover you waiting there for us. You anoint us to be your representatives, offering promise and purpose and direction all along. So lift us in our stuck moments and propel us forward to more lofty adventures. Continue to be the seed of your word alive and growing in us. Empower us to bear fruit wherever we're planted. For we confess, O oh God, that even with all of these your gifts given to us, sometimes our faith wavers, sometimes our confidence is shaken and on days our courage does fail. Our lives have not always represented Christ, and so today we pray for forgiveness, and we pray for your grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you for seeing the best that is in us, and for calling us to follow again in the ways of Christ. O oh Lord, by your Spirit, bring the joy of your kingdom close at hand, that we might share it and share you with backyard neighbors and friends and family and those who are ignored in this world, that people will come to know Christ by the words and deeds in our lives. It's in his name we pray it. Amen. May the richness of your life point to Jesus Christ. And whatever inadequacies you feel burdened down by, may you sense the promises of God reaching to you and offering encouragement and a hundredfold harvest. And because of that miracle, that grace, these promises, may God grant you progress and joy in the faith. Amen. Love me like nobody else
took off from the start You are the peace when my mind's at war And oh, you will never stop fighting for me When I can't fight for myself Every word is a promise you keep Cause you love me like